you have anything you want to praise God for tonight? Yes, Miss Nancy. I had a good report. I don't have to wear that thing on my back anymore, and I have been healed. I mean, I've been healed from the cancer and everything. Yeah. Thank you. 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 I seem to be a doing better and I'm trying to wean myself off the oxygen I'm okay. stuck with the rest of my life. Um, but um, I, if I ever get back to where I was at, I, I done promised her I'd slow down. So you won't slow down until you get back? Is that what well, you're no, 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 no. <laughs> I'm not doing anything now. Oh, okay, okay. Just, just for clarification. Very little. We're, I'm glad you're doing better, better there, Charlie. So, um, what else? God blessed you in a special way this past week. <coughs> John's brother Andy got released from the rehabilitation center. He's Did he really? Home. He's back home. Okay. Well, good. What else? I had an eye appointment Monday. Everything's stable. Good. I haven't gotten any better, but I haven't gotten any worse. Okay. So that's good. Right. That's always good for me. If I don't get any worse, I'm happy. Right. So. Yeah. That's good. If you're wondering what I do, what I'm doing, when you share even the praises and so forth, I try to make a note in my, on my prayer list. What else? I praise God for all of the, my sisters that I have. The, all my sisters and brothers here at church. And how they have to me. They're such a blessing. And I tell people that <coughs> if you miss the opportunity to go share with each other, you will lose it every time. And, and I just praise God for my church and my family. And we should be that way, shouldn't we? We should be a, that family to one another. Okay, anything else as far as praises go? All right. Okay, so let's go ahead and we'll open in prayer and, um, and we'll move on. So, Father, we just thank you, Lord, for your goodness and for your mercy. We thank you, Lord, for for answered prayer. And we thank you, Lord, for your hand moving in our lives and, and reminding us of both your presence and your goodness, of your power, but also of your mercy and love, of your holiness, as well as your majesty. Lord, we know that it is an honor, Lord, to be called the children of God. And when we consider, Father, who you are, and all your vastness, and all your incredible splendor father we are in awe uh, you lord are beyond our words to describe and yet father here we are and we're we're seeking to put into uh, into these words lord the the things that are fitting of you father and we know that they fall short but lord we could just testify all night and all day lord every day lord and still not have enough time and enough words, Lord, to describe your greatness. But Lord, we're here because of that greatness and because, Lord, you've been merciful to us, because, Lord, you are the cleanser of sins for those who trust in you, those who repent and come to you for life, Lord, you are faithful to grant it to them. And so, Lord, as we come to you, Lord, seeking your face through the, the lens of your holy word, the Bible, Father, we ask, Lord, that you would open our minds, that you would open our hearts, that our ears also would be open so that as you speak, so that as you reveal yourself, we'll hear and perceive you and receive from you the good things that you have for us, Lord. Lord, we uh, praise you for answered prayer. We thank you for all the ways that you've been faithful and demonstrated your 
you're watching over us time and time again, Lord, for healings and for protection and for provision, for guidance, Lord. And Lord, just the, the sustaining strength that you give to us as we trust in you and abide in your Holy Spirit. Father, we pray for the requests that have been mentioned, Father. We pray, Lord, that you'll move in healing. We pray, Lord, that you'll move in power. We pray, Lord, that you'll reach the, 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 the soul or the heart that seems closed off to you, Lord. Where our loved ones, Lord, are pursuing perhaps things in the world or are going after, Lord, things that exclude you, that chase, Lord, things that the world has promised to them, Lord, and yet, Lord, ultimately lead to destruction. Lord, we pray, Lord God, for these who are lost, who do not know the forgiveness of Jesus Christ, who do not know the, the, the hope and the joy and the peace that can only be found in him. We pray, Lord, that where there is a hard heart, that you would soften that heart. Where there are blind eyes, Lord, you would open those eyes. Where the ears will not hear you, Lord, we pray, Lord God, that you would remove the deafness and allow them, Lord, to hear you speak to them. May they receive, Lord, the gift that you offer them through Jesus Christ. The gift of forgiveness, the gift of eternal life, the gift of hope, the gift of being able to leave behind the shame and the condemnation and the brokenness and the defeat, Lord, of lives that are lived apart from you. And Lord, we pray that you'll help us to persevere in prayer. And when we are discouraged, Father, we pray that you would refresh us and renew our strength so that, Lord, we may continue that labor of prayer that you've appointed for us, for our loved ones, for people that we know, perhaps at work or at school or someplace, a neighbor, and even the stranger, Lord, that you bring into our paths. <coughs> Help us, Lord, to be faithful in prayer and in your word <coughs> and in our worship and in our love for one another. We praise you and we thank you that tonight as we read your word, Lord, that your spirit will speak. May our ears be open. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> okay, so if you will recall, we began in 1 Timothy chapter 1 last week. We read verses 1 through 11. Now, just as a refresher, what do what are some things that you recall from that first part of Paul's letter to his protege, Timothy? What do you remember, at least as far as the gist goes, what were some of the things that Paul wrote to him so far? He has a lot more yet to say. We've barely scratched the surface, barely got started. But in that first part, what do you recall? Of course, there's the opening, right? I do think this is your good buddy Paul, and I'm writing you a letter, and, and so forth. And then, that's my paraphrase, a very, very, very loose paraphrase, of course. But uh, how does he start? Do you remember, first of all, before you think, answer that, what is Timothy about to do? What is his business um, in, uh, at Ephesus, and why is Paul writing to him? Because he's going to take care, take charge of the church, Ephesus. Right, right. So, what can we assume about this church at Ephesus at this point in time, as Timothy takes the reins, so to speak, as their pastor? <coughs> what can we assume? They probably lack leadership. Okay, they probably have lacked leadership. And if a, if, a, if a church, or if you will, a flock, if it lacks leadership, what are some dangers that are uniquely um, uh, upon them, so to speak, because of their lack of leadership? Potentially. What's that? False teaching. And of course, Paul almost begins with that thought, doesn't he? He, he goes right into all the things that contend or fight with the truth of the gospel, you know, because what makes them a church, what holds them together is the simple gospel. It's the simple message of that gospel. They share that 
in common with one another. They could have different backgrounds, different ages, different <coughs> nationalities, etc. But what unites them into a church is the common link. That common link is the gospel. And so, if you're going to attack a flock and try to, you know, scatter the sheep, so to speak, you you attack what unites them, right? And so, um, uh, yeah. So a um, they're very vulnerable to that. They're a new church. Why why would they be vulnerable to false doctrine? Because they're not grounded in the word. Okay, they're not grounded in the word, and why would that be? Now, there are different potential reasons here. So, just speculate. What are some potential reasons that, that this young church might not be grounded in the word? Because they're new Christians and they haven't had a chance to learn. Right. Right. They don't really have books to go by. Yeah, they, they have the Old Testament. Well, they didn't call it the Old Testament. As far as they were concerned, they were the scriptures, right, at that point. Um, and of course, we know that um, after the what was essentially considered the the, the agreed upon core of, of of holy scriptures from the Jew uh, were added to that the first I, those eyewitness accounts of Jesus, his ministry, his death, his resurrection, which we call the there are four of them. What are they? The Gospels plus now and. and, and and now we also have these letters, which were then wiped because they were so applicable and so filled with truth and so obviously guided by the divine power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. They were shared among the different churches, and they corroborated the message of the gospel. In other words, they agreed with. And, um, and so that those things were part of or considered later to be part of what we call the Bible today. But at that point in time, the Bible was what we call the Old Testament. And some were more familiar with it than others. Uh, the church at Ephesus was, um, there, the church at Ephesus was, guess what? It was, it was almost at first entirely Jewish, but they lived in a very pagan city. And there were Gentile believers, but, but the, the great enemy, so to speak, of the church at Ephesus, aside from the legalism of some of the Jews, was the doctrine uh, or rather the, uh, the false religion uh, of the Roman uh, people, and there, had, there was a particular temple in the city of Ephesus to Diana, um, or the Greek, the Greek version of those artists. So they had these other worldly religions, and they were contending with those things, and there was a philosophy at that time that really threatened the early church too, that actually predates Christianity it was a spiritualism. We've talked about it a few times. It was, it's been mentioned in Sunday school, and it was called Gnosticism. And at that time, because Christianity really began as God worked, and people began to believe the gospel, people who were Gnostic saw the success of that and wanted to ride along the train, so to speak. And they began to use some of the Christian language, and there was some confusion. And some of those people crept into the early church and were threatening the simple message of the gospel, which we've talked about over and over again. So, that's a big deal, isn't it? And the fact that they weren't grounded, so to speak, as they ought to have been. Now, you know, this is an early church, and when you have new Christians, what's one thing you can assume about a new Christian? Or should assume about a new Christian? Whatever, however excited they are, however on fire they are, what is going to be true of a new Christian, a brand new Christian, no matter whether, no matter, no matter their age, physical age, what's going to be true of them? What's, what's that? They, yeah, they might grasp the essence of the gospel, you know, otherwise they wouldn't be Christian, but they're not going to be well rooted in it yet. They are born again, but they're still babies. And they've got to grow in that. Because we believe the gospel, but it isn't just enough to believe the gospel in this head sense. We've talked about what it means to believe it in the heart sense. And that means we believe the gospel and, and understand that what we believe about the gospel, the power of the gospel, the message of the gospel should permeate how we live life in every other area. So we grow in maturity. And you know what growing in maturity in regard to the gospel means? It means that in believing the gospel, I live out my faith in the gospel in practical ways. 
how I handle my children, how I handle my money, what I do at work, and so forth. How I serve in the church, and so forth and so on. And all of that has at its root this simple thing, that I believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if I mess with that, then I begin to corrupt every other area of my life. If you mess with that in a church, you begin to corrupt you no matter what its intentions are, no matter how good it might try to be and how wonderfully serving they may look, if you mess with this simple message of the gospel, it corrupts and misdirects everything else about that church, just as, as, just as surely as it does an individual believer. So a new church is going to be filled with new believers, baby Christians who then need to grow up. And so they start with the milk of the gospel, and then they go on to meat. What does it mean? What does it mean that Jesus died, and that he has forgiven me, and that I walk in his ways now, empowered by the Holy Spirit? What does that mean? Well, it, 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 it's, it, it, it's, it's so powerful that it, it should affect every other aspect of my life. And so here I am growing up, hopefully. Here we are growing up in the truth of the gospel, and we're living out the implication of the gospel, the message of the gospel in every part of life. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> excuse me. Okay, so they're, they're new Christians, they're a new church, and Timothy has this special commission or charge of Paul, and ultimately from God, to shepherd them well, right? To help them in these baby steps and the season of early growth. And hopefully, as he's doing that, what he's doing is working himself out of a job, if you will, in a sense, if you know what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, is that where he's discipling, where he's encouraging, where he's helping them to learn the scriptures and what it means to believe them, that he's helping others to learn, and then as they learn and mature, they then also begin to teach and mentor and encourage and shepherd the sheep of God. It's a big deal, isn't it? It's huge. And if they mess it up here, consider where they'd be in 10 years. Consider where they'd be in 100 years. Either it would be some crazy aberration that it would no longer at all resemble uh, what Christ intended, or they'd be simply dead as a church. So Timothy has been charged by Paul to to shepherd them and to start with, you know, and of course, you know, he's going to deal with, you know, dissensions and help people to get learn how to get along and how to have a good work ethic and, 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 and take on leadership and grow in that way. Um, but he's, he starts, of course, with the gospel, the simplicity of the gospel. We always come back to that, don't we? We always come back to the central, the central I like to say it as the uh, centrality of Christ, that central theme, an essential ingredient, which is Jesus, the Son of God, died for sinners, of whom I am chief, that rose again, that those who place their faith in him truly are made new and are born again and are called the children of God. Okay, so uh, he talks about the law, which in verses 8 and following is a reference to, again, what they knew at that time as the scriptures. Okay, And it's important to acknowledge this because God is consistent on building on the scriptures. He's consistent with the importance of the scriptures and everything that he has said in the Old Testament. We do not discard. We know that what he said in the Old Testament was the word of God, and it's still the word of God. We have the gospel to illuminate and to help us to understand now the things that he said in the Old Testament, way, the Old Testament in ways that they did not understand. For instance, Jesus said, I did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. And when he talks about the two great commandments, he says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength and mind. And then the second is like to it, he said, the second great commandment is to Love your neighbor as yourself. And then he said, upon these two commandments hang all the law and all the prophets. Everything else hangs on those two things. Loving God with all our heart, soul, and strength and loving one another. 
And you know, of course, that the Ten Commandments follow those two themes. God is first love. People next. Okay, so here he is. He, he's, he's telling Timothy, here is your charge. It's special. It's holy. It's from God. And we're going to, we're going to look at what's happening, Timothy, in your context in this congregation and what God has called you to do here in light of in the, the illumination of what his word has said. And we do that today, I hope. That what we say, what we do, comes from the illumination, comes from the light that he grants us from his word. So everything we know about how to be a church, how we handle one another, how we respond to the world and needs around us and so forth, it comes from where? Hopefully, it comes from the word. If, we, if it doesn't come from the word, if it comes from some weird idea, or what I think is a great idea, for me, or from the world, or from a best-selling book, then we've kind of lost our way. So we come back to the Word. Books can be helpful. I'm not, I'm not uh, saying don't read books. I'm just saying that in order of priority, in order of preeminence, that the Word of God trumps everything else. Okay, so, um, basically that brings us then to verse 12 of chapter 1. Um, would somebody like to read verses 12 through 20? I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful, putting me into service. Even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor, yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in belief. And the grace of God was more than abundant with the faith of love which are found in Christ Jesus. It is trustworthy statement, uh, deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost of all. Yet for this reason I found mercy, so that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. This command I entrust to you, Timothy, my son, in accordance with the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you fight the good fight, keeping faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected and suffered shipwreck in regard to their faith. Among these are Hemorrhaeans and Alexander, who I have given over to Satan, so that they will be taught not to blaspheme. Okay. So, in some ways, this is still part of Paul kind of setting up what he's about to tell Timothy. Um, you know, much of the point in the whole letter that he writes to Timothy has to do with what he wants Timothy to do, things to keep in mind, things that he should prioritize in terms of how he serves this congregation with the city of Ephesus. So part of the context of that then, as Paul writes to Timothy and says, I know what I'm talking about, and this is, this is why I want you to listen to me, it has to do with some of his own personal experiences. And comes to play because Paul, in recognizing that he's a, he does not deserve God's grace, and yet has been given tremendous grace, that, that all of Paul's experiences and all the things that Timothy is going to experience as shepherd of this flock of sheep in Ephesus has to do with God's mercy and goodness. And that what God has done in Paul's life has relevance for what's going to happen in Timothy's life and, what, and, it, and it means something because Timothy is going to encounter people who um, are like Paul. You know, Timothy's story is actually a little different than Timothy, we don't know a lot of details per se, but it would seem that he kind of he is he's become he's a believer and he's become a pastor, but his story has been largely um, unmarked by uh, some of the overt rebellion of Paul's life. What do you remember about Paul's um, life before he became a Christian? Yeah, he thought he was right. He was persecuting 
Christians. But even though he thought he was right, he thought he was doing a good thing, he describes himself in verse 13 as a blasphemer, as a persecutor, and as an insolent opponent or insolent or proud and obnoxious enemy of God. He thought he was doing it right, but here's the truth. And that, this is an important caution for all of us. I mean, we can think we're doing the right thing. But unless we're really abiding in the Spirit of God and allowing Him to, to, um, to dwell and abide in His Word and be confronted by it and challenged by it and changed by it, we might very well be the kind of person that Paul was before he encountered Christ. We could be blaspheming God. If I'm not deeply in the Word of God, if I'm not seeking His truth and I'm not seeking to live His truth and to practice the truth that He has revealed to me, then what would have made Paul? Why would that? Why would Paul have been a blasphemer? Been a yeah. Why? Why was Paul blasphemer? He was religious, and given what he thought at the time, and he was actually a student of the Word of God, so to speak. He was a Pharisee, right? He was a Pharisee's Pharisee. He was very religious. He knew the Word of God, but why was he a blasphemer? His heart wasn't in the right place. His heart wasn't in the right place. What makes a person a blasphemer? What is blasphemy? The ultimate expression of blasphemy is denying Christ. But if you want to boil it down a different way, one way you could look at it is simply this. Speaking contrary to God's truth. If you say, well, I don't want to say any of those things as an example, but um, but if I say something contrary to who God says about himself, if I somehow say that God is not all-powerful or all-knowing, or that God is not holy, or, the, or that God is not just, or that his word is not truth, those are blasphemies because I'm speaking in, contrary to the reality of who he is. I'm speaking contrary to the fact that he is God, that he is righteous, that he is true, that Jesus is his son. If I'm denying Christ, why is that blasphemy? Because he is God. And God has revealed himself through Christ. And if I deny that Jesus is the Son of God, then whatever my intentions may be, I'm in blasphemy. I'm blaspheming him. Persecutor, an insolent opponent. <clears throat> there are two places in this chapter that I think are interesting, and they run parallel in a way. In verse 13, he says, I received mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. What does verse 16 say? He says, I received mercy for this reason. I received mercy because Jesus would display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. So there are two different things going on there, but basically in both instances he says he receives mercy. What's the reason for the for in saying he received mercy in, the, in verse uh, 13? And you referred to it, John. He did what he did in ignorance. Right. It wasn't... Yeah, so there is a, it, it isn't strictly causal, you know, because a lot of people act in ignorance and they're going to be judged in their ignorance in spite of the fact that they were ignorant, thought they were doing a good thing, they're still going to be judged by it. So um, God doesn't excuse the ignorance. But there is a correlation between the fact that he was ignorant, thought he was doing a good thing, thought he was serving God, and the fact that he, uh, well, he, he wasn't, and he received mercy anyway. So there does, there, there does seem to be a correlation between the fact that he received mercy and his willful intent in the first place. But the second thing I think is really important, and that's verse 16. Why does it say that he received mercy there? Because Jesus wants to show something. So God chooses him. Why? Long suffering. Right? Yeah. Would you read it, Bonnie? Go ahead and read it. 16. Especially the latter part. However, for this week reason. I obtain mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show all love and suffering as a pattern to these 
to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. Right. So for whatever reason, God in his sovereignty singles Paul out and shows him mercy. Now Paul knows this. Okay, this is important. Paul knows he does not deserve the mercy he's been shown. He does not mean in verse 13 that he got mercy just because he didn't know what he was doing. All right? So it's a dangerous thing for us to isolate verse 13 and think, well, if people don't know what they're doing, then they're okay. No, that's not what that means. It does mean that it, it, his heart was prepared for the mercy that God is going to show to him. But there are a lot of people who are going to be in hell who have good intentions. But Paul received mercy. You and I, if we're believers, have received mercy, not because we deserved it, but because, in part, God intends to make a spectacle of your life. God shows grace through your life. So, it's, a, it's not a good thing if a person is so caught up in their own goodness and their greatness and their moral uh, piety that, uh, that uh, they're so focused on that and have forgotten how miserable a sinner they really are in themselves. I'm going to be blunt with you. I love you all and I don't take this the wrong way. But you're a miserable sinner. You deserve hell. So do I. But Jesus has had mercy on you. And he's opened your heart to receive that mercy. And now you can walk in that mercy. And God, through the mercy he has shown you, is putting on display his son Jesus and the mercy that he shows through Jesus. Isn't that amazing? So it matters. So it's, uh, it's important that we remember that so that we give to God the glory and we don't take the glory. You know, because sometimes we can be, Satan would like to trick us into thinking that we are somehow responsible for our own um, goodness. And there's no such thing. I have no goodness in myself. But goodness I have, God has placed there. And Paul, he testifies to this. I received mercy for this reason, that in me, Verse 16, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. And then Paul, he, 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 he just, his heart is melting with praise to the Lord for this. And he says, to the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. It's to God be the glory. In other words, Paul, Paul is saying, to God be the glory that I'm Christian. To God be the glory that I have salvation. To God be the glory, Timothy, that I can even tell you about these things. To God be the glory, Timothy, that you are a Christian. To God be the glory that you can now lead and encourage his people in your truth, in God's truth. To God be the glory. So, as a result of this, as a result of this, verse 18, because we, his desire is for God to be glorified, he gives Timothy a charge. It's interesting, too, what he says here. He says, this charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, or fight the good fight. Of course, we talked last time about uh, the influences of faith that were part of Timothy's story, which was very different, as you know, from Paul's story. Timothy had his mother and his grandmother, who were believers. And God, working in their life, opened the door for Timothy in hearing the gospel to receive that gospel. God blessed that, and he became a Christian. And now he's growing in his walk and his maturity, and he's going to pass on to others now what Paul has invested in him, or what rather I should say God has, through Paul, invested in him. And knowing that God was at work, they spoke prophetically about him. In verse 19, part of that charge has to do with, what does it say in verse 19? Verse 19, 
holding. I'm sorry. Okay, holding on to faith and good conscience. Right. What does it mean if we were to, 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 to take that statement, holding faith? Staying true to your word. Train, staying true to your word. Okay. Yeah. And other thoughts that I think as I read it too, of course, when you talk about having faith in someone, what do you mean when you say you have faith in someone? You trust them, right? You trust them. So holding faith, trusting God, continuing in his trust of God, that what God has started, God will complete, that God will be with them, and God will sustain them, God will be at work in the seed that he sows, and so forth. So holding faith and a good conscience. In other words, not being provoked. As a believer, we do say, you constantly have somebody in the world pushing your buttons. Am I the only person ever thinks things like that? You ever feel like people and circumstances are pushing your buttons? What is that? What are we driving mean? it when you're driving in the big city? Driving in the big city. Yeah. Yeah. I have a lot of commentary for people who were cutting me off or running me up, you know, slowing driving too slow in the past like that. I have a lot of things that, in my flesh, I start saying, and God says, Tom, pull over and let Diane drive. Yeah. <laughs> to have a good conscience has, some, has a lot to do with when the circumstances of life and the impulses of, of your own flesh and the temptations of your pride rise up within you and you are tempted to do things that are contrary to the nature of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit lives in you, and there's a nature that is associated with him. That is the divine nature. That is the Holy Spirit's nature. And it contends with those impulses of the flesh. There's a tension between, if you will, the flesh and the spirit. The flesh, all those things that I want to do, if I'm on autopilot, I'm going to start doing I'm going to say those angry things on the road, maybe things I shouldn't say, or maybe do things I shouldn't do, maybe not just in terms of anger, it could be other kinds of things, it could be things out of fear, or coveting, or, or whatever, it, those things that come with the flesh, I just feel like doing this, and I feel like doing that, and, and often those impulses some come so fast, they catch us off guard, and we act on them, and then regret it almost instantly. Sometimes we'll entertain those impulses and we'll pet them like a cat, you know, and, and we'll entertain it, we'll think about it, but we won't do anything about it. We'll just think about it, we just kind of fantasize about it, we'll pet the cat some more, and then we find that it's a tiger and it's devouring us. That's what the flesh will do, the impulses of the flesh will do, and it's contrary to the Spirit of God. So a good conscience then has to do with doing what is right according to God. It's to follow those promptings of the Holy Spirit as he uses the word of God to speak to our situation. For instance, um, someone we're going to deal with a, an angry, let's say you're a salesperson and you have a customer who comes in and they come in complaining and they're angry and they're presenting themselves in such a way that, that it's, it's pushing your buttons. And you feel your back rising up, right? The Spirit of God moves in you and reminds you that a soft answer turns away wrath. That's, I'm using that as an example. Maybe he specifically brings that verse to your mind. You recall it and you think... While you're tempted on one hand to get in this person's face and shout back, you know, and run the risk of coming to blows, a soft answer turns away wrath. Okay, Lord. I'm sorry, sir. Would you like to explain again to me the situation? Do you see? And we handle it differently. And God brings to our mind a particular truth or principle from his word so that we are equipped to face that situation, so that we, in that crisis of circumstance, 
could, can, with good conscience, respond as God wants us to and respond in such a way that Jesus is glorified. Which is what Paul was talking about just a few verses earlier, right? So it matters how I respond. I respond trusting him, only faith, and I respond in good conscience. You, they're not separable. Those are, those are hand in hand. If I trust God, then I take to heart the things from God, and I utilize those resources that God has given to me from God's word. Does that make sense? What happens if you don't do this? What if you don't quite believe God? Well, you're going to take life into your own hands, aren't you? You're going to start doing things, and this, I find this to be true when I do it. You take things in your own hands. You solve problems with your own wisdom. You say the first things that come out of your mouth. You act on those impulses, because I don't know that God's going to handle this the way that it ought to be handled, like I know better. Do you know sometimes it makes us angry that God is so patient with other people? We want to make them pay for their crimes. Remember, remember Jonah? Right? Remember that he didn't want to go to Nineveh? Why didn't he want to go to Nineveh? There's a bad place full of bad people. Those are pagans and they have persecuted your people, oh God. Why would I want to go to these worshipers of Dagon? Jonah, I told you to go. I'm not going to do it. And he runs away, or sails away. And God says, you only think you're going to get away with this. And he taught him that he, in mercy, instead of dealing with Jonah in what he deserved in, in his rebellion against God, God was merciful. It was not a happy experience, a pleasant experience, and I can't imagine being swallowed by every fish and have no desire to ever learn what that feels like. But that's what it took. And then Jonah obeyed grudgingly. And you'll recall that as you come to the end of that book, the end of um, Jonah's story, you don't know how his story actually ends. Because he preaches through the city. And what happens to the city of Nineveh? They repent. And he goes and he climbs it up and he's on the high place and he's sitting there in a hot sun and he's waiting to see what's going to happen, hoping that they're not going to repent so that God will judge them because that's what he wants. He wants judgment. <coughs> what does God do? Isn't it interesting you, just how God, merciful God was to Jonah in this? You, God didn't have to put up with this. He didn't have to go to the lengths that he does to, to, to speak to Jonah's heart. But he's sitting in the hot sun. You know the story. This vine grows up and he's in the shade right and he's thankful for the shade because it's hot and then god sends you know the story tell me he sends that yeah that worm thing and it ate it and it died and then he doesn't have any shade anymore and he's angry about that and then god speaks to him he speaks to him and says jenna you get so angry over that why should i not be concerned you worry about a a vine, and I'm concerned about a people. That's what we do when we trust ourselves more than God. We take the shortcuts. We do the simple solutions, those fast fixes to things. We put band-aids on problems and we don't solve them. And in the end, what we do is make matters worse. Don't we? we don't hold faith. Or we become impatient and we don't have good conscience. Never, ever, ever does the end justify the means. The means, how you get someplace is important, yes. But how you get there matters to God. That's the good conscience part of this. And there are some who reject that, some who like the shortcut, some who don't think it matters and they think that the end justifies the means. And in verse 19, they who reject this run the risk of doing what? How does that end? How, how does verse 19 end? Rejected and suffer shipwreck. What's that? They are rejected and suffer shipwreck. That's right. They're rejected. They are suffer, they suffer, they have made, in, in essence, 
a shipwreck of their faith, what they call faith. It's a mess. They have, they have begun to complicate the simplicity of the gospel and the simple power, the, the, the amazing but simple power of just trusting God. Just trusting God. Trusting God to the point that I obey God in God's time and God's way. I make a shipwreck. I confuse myself. I confuse others. This is what happens when people trust their own way. This is what happens when a church gets sidetracked and doesn't quite trust God anymore. It makes a shipwreck of itself. And just as surely, you know, when you think about a shipwreck, different ways you could envision it, but one way that I think is profoundly appropriate, it's this, it's that a ship that's sailing fails to miss the hidden rocks in the sea and tears a breach in its hull so that water comes on and the ship begins to sink. We hit the rocks of life, of circumstances, and then things happen and because they haven't trusted God in other areas. They don't know how to trust God in these areas. They don't know how to handle God when there's loss. They don't know how to handle life when tragedy comes, or when someone beloved to them rejects them and disassociates them and, and so forth. They don't know how to handle those things, and the ship of their faith hits that and tears a hole in it because it's not where it needs to be, and it takes on water of despair, sinks below the surface in despondency, of brokenness, of hopelessness. There's only one solution, and that is to get back to this, the simple fact that we as God's children simply need to learn to trust God. To trust Him on a daily basis, not just the certain categories of life, but in every part of life. In verse 20, he names a couple of people who have... Uh, made shipwrecks of their faith. Hymenaeus, Alexander, and I, I believe based on kind of where he goes with that too, is that they become influential with other believers. Remember, these are baby Christians. And so here we have a couple of guys who possibly have taken on some notions about what it means to be a Christian that's not in alignment with what God actually has to say. And they're trying to live a kind of Christianity that is false or not founded on the truth. And because they have believed it, they have then taught it and modeled it for other people. And so it's like leaven in the bread, spoiling the rest of the batch, so to speak. And so Paul does what? He says something very profound here. He says that he's handed them over to whom? To Satan, in other words, he has released them into the influence and the power of Satan so that they may, what, learn to not blaspheme, to speak contrary to what God has said, because that's what they've been doing. They've been, otherwise they wouldn't have said this, they have been speaking in ways that are contrary to the truth of what, what is God's word. So, in this instance, Satan, even though he's in many ways a spiritual enemy, this is, this is the thing about Satan. Satan is, yes, he is your, the enemy of your soul, and he's the prince of this world, and he is God's enemy. Yes, but you know what? He's also a tool in the hand of God. He can do no more than God permits him to do. And what God permits him to do serves ultimately the purposes of God. What's one of the best examples you can think of that in, the, in the scriptures? Uh, in the Old Testament. What's one of the best examples of that? It's very explicitly said. Job. Job. Yeah. God speaks to Job and singles, or God speaks to Satan and singles out Job to Satan. Have you thought about Job? Now, Job hadn't done anything wrong. Nevertheless, 
God uses the tool of Satan to reveal himself at the end of Job. It takes a while to get there. You work through a lot of soliloquies from Job and his friends, you know, a lot of back and forth and so on. But in the end, you see that what it does ultimately for Job is to reveal God to Job in ways he never knew him. And God is glorified. And Job is brought into a much more profound and intimate relationship with God. Listen, God is so interested in your life that he is intentional about allowing those things to happen in your life that will bring you closer, to, to cause you to cling to him. And, and you, you often will find that you've not done anything wrong or you can't account for the reasons that you were experiencing hardship, but those things happen. And the goal of God is to bring you closer to himself. That you would trust him. That you would know that he's the comforter, that he is the healer, that he is, the, he is your strength, he's your foundation. And so on and so on. There's so many ways that we could describe God in those instances. And even in this context, even though I'm in AS and Alexander means real apparently sneakers, um, even here, Paul says, yeah, I pray that though I'm, I'm, I'm handing them over, I'm, I'm relinquishing an attempt to reel them in. I'm just letting go of them and letting God hand them over to Satan so that they learn not to blaspheme. In other words, so that they learn that God is God. That God is God. And what more the, do they, what do they need most? They need to know that God is God. They need to believe that God is God. That's what we need to. We need to know that God is God. And that in knowing that and believing that, that God is the God who, who makes promises, who makes a covenant, and then keeps the covenant that he makes with his people. So if he says that he is your redeemer, if he says he's your comforter, if he says that he is your bread of life, then is he not those things? But how often do we look for those things and other things? We'll look for strength from other sources. We'll look for sustenance and fulfillment in other sources. And then God has to allow circumstances. He'll work in our heart, but he'll also allow circumstances in our lives that take away our self-sufficiency or reveal that the thing I trusted is an imposter. And we're an idol. Why does God do that? He does it in large part simply because He loves you and you're His child. Do you have any thoughts on that? A lot of stuff there in just half a chapter, isn't there? Sometimes I have the thought that I can't accept all God's love he has for me. Some days it just I just can't believe he loves me. You think about it, we're finite. We're like a cup. And the <coughs> ocean being poured into it. More than we can handle the, the very thing we need most too. You can't run that well dry, can you? No, the well of God's love. What else? I can't believe that God's been so good to me. In all of the operations and things I've had. Yeah. How did I deserve it? Yeah. No, you didn't. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I'm not being, I'm not being, you know, smart alecky with you. I mean, it, God is so good to us in way, in, in every way that He's good to us. That's a way that we don't, don't even realize He's doing. Yes, you're exactly right. Yeah, it's so much more than our brains can comprehend, our senses can take in. I'm reminded in these verses of a time when I went camping one time and. Um, pulled in this nice secluded spot 
all of them. Beth was very young and she had a little cousin with her. She was young also. They might have been seven, eight. Well, we hadn't been there, I know, 10 minutes, set up camp, and here comes this Harley motorcycle. I had loud motorcycle, little bitty guy on this huge chopper, making all kinds of noise, and he backs into the spot right next to us. And I thought, oh no, not with these little girls. We just can't have this. And so with this, I look, and the guy gets off his motorcycle, and to the back, he's wearing leathers, the State Christian Motorcycle Association. <laughs> and one of the things, we had church every night, he was there with us. He shared our, fire, our campfire, and all he brought with him was a tent, and he said, sometimes I just need to rest, you know, from wearing, you know. And I, we, we were reminded that, um, and he, he said several times that where, where my sin abound, and what he told us what he was before he was in the Christian Motorcycle Association and and how he did things in ignorance okay and then he was brought to the full knowledge of Christ and from that time on he's been you know on a motorcycle going to different places, meeting up with people, and witnessing for Christ, just like he did with us. Yeah. And he was just so thrilled, you know, that we were we were believers too, and he, we knew what he was talking about. It. And it, it was the best camp time we ever, ever had. And he, <coughs> and he gave the, the girls a little biker's Bible, and I thought, please, Beth, don't carry that to church. <laughs> but, but he signed it. To for the girls and and said if ever you need anything my name is sheep herder and I will help you and he just he would and he meant it you know um, that still has that Bible and and uh, she still remembers that they both girls were very young but they remember that camp trip that's awesome and I thought it, yeah. it doesn't always appear the way it is yeah. you know I suppose that's a good reminder that um, um, what we expect of God is still a finite yeah. picture. And God is so much bigger than my picture. You know, We want to know God and his hugeness that we really need to get in the word and be in the word so that we can have our minds open to how great and good he is. Father, we think of uh, your goodness and your faithfulness, Lord, and we're encouraged. We thank you, Lord, for showing up in our lives. Uh, you were there all along, Lord, but, but you showed up in a sense, Lord. And, and, and Lord, we find that you opened our eyes to the fact that you loved us and you have a plan for us. And that as we trust you, as we choose, Lord, to walk in your truth, Lord, you have things for us, things that encourage us, things that's, that begin to break the chains. Lord, of the lies of the world, the things we've trusted in, Lord, that would only lead us to, to hell. Lord, we find that you are good, and we find that you're faithful, and we find, Lord, that there is more forgiveness in you than, than, than all the ways, Lord, we've tried your patience, and then all the ways, Lord, we've fallen and failed, all the, all the ways, Lord, that we've rebelled against you. And that for each of us, Lord, if we'll come to you, there is forgiveness. There is healing. There is renewal. And there is life. So we thank you, Lord, that we have these things in Jesus. And we thank you, Lord, that as we leave here and as we go to our homes, Lord, that you're there. And Lord, help us to be so confident of your goodness and of your power and of your faithfulness, Lord, that Lord, our spirits are able to rest in truth tonight. We love you. We thank you that you love us, even when we were so hard to love. We pray in Jesus' name.